I'd like to thank the funders of the Canadian Cochrane Centre for providing support to us for the work that we do, including these webinars, particularly the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the institutes that are listed there. I'd also like to thank PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, for providing us with a software license so that we can hold these sessions on Illuminate. To participate in today's session, you'll see a participant window that has a hand with a green, uh, green raising to ask a question. You'll also see emoticons. So can everybody send a happy face if you can hear me? Beautiful. Thank you so much. So do feel free at any point during today's session, if there's something that you agree with or something that, that excited you or something you found funny, please do feel free to send an emoticon and let us know how you're doing. You'll see a, uh, you'll see a little round of applause if you definitely agree with something that someone said. You'll see a thumbs down and you'll also see a I'm confused, I'm not sure what's going on sort of face. You'll also see a green check mark and a red cross. We use these when we're going to be doing polls later, so please do keep your eye there when I let you know that it's time to make a vote, and you'll see those options change so that you can participate in the session. For the format of today's webinar, only one person's audio will be activated at a time. This is to prevent all sorts of feedback and confusion on the line. So if you would like to speak, please raise your hand using the little hands with the green arrow going up to indicate that you'd like to ask a question. For today's session, the questions are going to be asked during specific question periods, so I'd like to ask you to save your questions until that point. You can also feel free to use the chat room and type in your questions, so where you've been indicating, uh, indicating your vacation time and places. Um, you can feel free to write a question in there, and the moderators or uh, presenters will get to that when they have a chance. To use your audio, look at, for the audio button that shows a microphone with a hand raised, sorry, with a microphone raised. To speak, click on that so that the microphone turns up, and please remember to let go. You need to click again to turn it off. The speaker will instruct you when it's time to speak. So I'd like to introduce you to the methods group. These are the presenters who have very kindly given their time today to talk about the work that they're doing with the Cochrane Agenda Setting and Priority Setting Methods Group. I'd like to introduce Sally Crow, Mona Nasser, Reshma Carlo, Sandy Oliver, and Vivian Welch. Sally has a nursing and public health background. She chairs the James Lind Alliance Monitoring and Implementation Group and is based in the UK. She also leads Crow Associates Limited, which provides consultancy, training, and project management. Sally is one of the co-conveners of the new methods group. So thank you for joining today, Sally. I'd also like to introduce you to Vivian Welch. Vivian Welch works at the Center for Global Health based at the University of Ottawa. She's also one of the co-conveners of, uh, of the Cochrane Agenda and Priority Setting Methods Group. She has a PhD in population health and works with Peter Tugwell and his team at the Campbell and Cochrane Equity Methods Group. Sandy Oliver is also based in the UK and recently co-authored the James Lind Alliance Guidebook. She's an editor with the Cochrane Consumers and Communication Review Group and is one of the co-conveners of the Methods Group as well. Mona Nasser, who's been coordinating this series, and a thank you to Mona, um, is based in the UK at the Peninsula Dental School as a clinical lecturer in evidence-based dentistry. Prior to that, she had been at the German Institute for Quality and Efficiency in Healthcare, based in Germany and she originally graduated as a dentist from Iran. So thank you so much to everybody for joining today. The last person who I'd like to introduce is Reshma Carlo, who has a background in clinical research and regulatory medical writing. She's based at the Bahrain branch of the UK Cochrane Centre and has been a consumer referee for a number of Cochrane reviews and protocols. She's the administrator of the Agenda and Priority Setting Group. So thank you very much to, uh, to today's presenters. Um, it's wonderful to have them here today to talk to us about the methods group and its activities. 
I'd like to turn it over to Mona Nasser to start off today's session. Um, thank you very much, Erin. Um, I hope everybody is fine. And if you hear me very well, could you send me a smiley face? So I'm sure that you hear me well. Oh, great. So I see a lot of smileys. So I hope it means that our everybody is hearing me well. Um, so today um, is supposed to be a session to give you an opportunity to get to know the methods group, to know who we are, what we are planning to do, what are the different projects that we are doing. And it would start with an um, with introductory presentation from me about the methods group. And afterwards, I would hand over to Reshma, who would talk about our website and one of the surveys that we are planning, which we hope that many of you would be interested to fill up. Afterwards, Sally would talk about the James Lane Alliance Initiative and involving patients and clinicians in private setting. I have to add that the James Lane Alliance is one of our main partners in the methods group. Um, we would have a question and discussion session. Um, that, um, we wouldn't be handing, as Erin said, we wouldn't be handing over the microphone during the presentation, but feel free to send questions on the chat room. I try to keep an eye and answer it, but if I didn't answer it, repeat and remind me in the question discussion um, period. And afterwards, Vivian and Sandy would be talking about their very specific project. So the next slide. Um, that's a, that's, a, that's a picture that I have on, uh, painted to demonstrate how the methods group was developed, which shows that the Jameson alliance ship over the waves of Cochrane. Um, OK, I start with um, introducing our core conveners. Um, Erin has um, introduced a number of them already who we are presenting here. I would like add to uh, introduce you to three other persons who are also named as core conveners here. Pratap Tarian, who is a professor in psychiatry and the director of South Asian Cochrane Center, and he would helping us to keep an eye to keep an eye about the aspect of developing countries in research part setting. Ed Wilson, who is a lecturer in health economics in the University of East Anglia, and he would help us to get more deeper understanding of the quantitative approaches in private setting. And he has kindly also he's also kindly agreed to be in the session today. Uh, so if you had a qu quantitative question, I would hand over to Ed. And uh, finally, Alessandro Liberati, who unfortunately passed away recently on 1st January 2012. He has been a professor of medical statistics in Italy and the director of the Italian Cochrane Center. He was doing a project in our group that's called, that he called CRR, which I would explain later what he's doing. And we would definitely keep on doing what he was, uh, what he was doing in our methods group. Um, so just to be sure that I'm still, everybody's hearing me well because I saw new people um, have arrived. Could you send me another smiley face? Oh, oh cool. Oh, yeah, it looks good. OK, going on to the next one. Um, I want to give you a little bit of history of our methods group, how he was developed, how we came to this point, and why we decided to establish the methods group. Um, the history started in 2006 with the steering group of the collaboration, um, decided that um, there is a lot of criticism to the collaboration about how they select the topics and whether we address prioritize topics or not. They would like to look more carefully in it. And they funded a Cochrane prioritization funding scheme. And several groups have applied and got the funding. One of them was a group that um, Peter Topper led, and I, Vivian Welsh, and Ari Newfing were involved. And when we were starting to do the project, we recognized there is already a lot of people doing prior setting and collaboration. And before um, trying to do a new thing, we should go and ask people what they have done. And it goes, it is in line with the general principles of the Cochrane collaboration, avoiding the application of effort. So um, we went back and looked at all, we asked all of the Cochrane entities. And to our surprise, there was a lot more work ongoing that we had thought. The, and um, I don't give you a quantitative number now, because it has, been, it has changed over years. And more and more groups are doing prior setting at the moment. But what we did at this stage is we tried to keep up to date with what they do and presented in several workshops in the Cochrane Colloquium. 
and we can have a discussion about how we can improve as a collaboration the way that we select and prioritize topics for cochrane reviews. During the discussions, there were several issues coming up. Issues like people, there was a wide variety of methods for prioritization. Which of them is a better method, and which of them should we select? For, should cochrane try to select? There was no clear answer to it, and there was a lot of issues about how to implement it, how to get people involved, how to ensure that the topics get done as a review. Another issue that all very commonly come up is the question, who are the stakeholders we have to involve to research by its setting? Are, are they patients, policy makers, practitioners, or all of them? How we should handle when we have all of them involved? You will learn more from Sally about this. And another one is equity. How we c inequalities in health. Um, it's a very recognized issue. We know the social determinants of health has a role about how the impact, uh, the effectiveness of many of the interventions. And um, the question is how we can incorporate it, and not only questions that are important to people, the advantaged groups come up in a prior setting, but also the disadvantaged groups. You would hear about it more from me and Erin next week in another webinar about it. And then there are two other issues that's very specific to the Cochrane collaboration was how we deal with prioritizing new versus updating topics and how we deal with issues about um, capacity building. Because sometimes some topics for Cochrane review are selected not because they are a priority topic, but because they are helpful to um, mentor new authors. So this resulted in, in a bigger discussions about how we can address the problem, how, how we can help to people. The first thing we did, we got all together and we are, we are publishing all of this work that we have done separately in a series of articles with the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, which is now undergoing going publication. We also started the Cochrane Review on Parts Setting. However, we recognized there is a lot of gap in the methodological and peripheral research in this field which was the basis that we need even more work to be able to address all of these questions, which was the basis of establishing these methods groups. The methods groups intend to inform the Cochrane authorities about the current available and partial evidence about prior setting, be a form of discussion, and also conduct a research research if we get funding for it. OK, I go to the next slide. Uh, before going further, I have a question for everybody. Who thinks that we, have, we should involve always patients in the research part setting exercise? If you agree, send me a smiley face. Well, five people agree. And who would agree? Who would think, oh, I should probably now know it's more than five, seven people. Who would think that we should involve um, funders in the research part setting exercise? One, two. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's interesting. We have somebody disagreeing, and uh, the all the five people agreeing that there should be funders involved. That's interesting. I um I wouldn't give you. I think if after you hear Sally's presentation, you would probably have might have a different idea about it. So then, um, this is a code that I always mention when I talk about translation. And the code from John Ionidas, he said, sometimes the bias is not in the study design itself. It's, it's not the answer. It's in the question. And I think part of what we are doing is addressing this. And another aspect of it is um, how I changed the code is sometimes the bias lies in the whole research agenda. Because one of the things that we have seen is that um, because certain people define this, uh, the agenda of research, certain type of research are more done than the others. Like intervention-oriented research is more done than the research on supporting individual responsibility to, to um, obtain their own, uh, to keep their own health care. Or disciplinary approach in research is more commonly funded or done rather than interdisciplinary approaches. Um, I, when we were, when we were tried, when, before we started to do the Cochrane review, one of the other things we thought to do, again, avoiding the application of review effort, was to look whether there are other reviews done on project setting and what we can learn from them. And uh, we find about eight, 
eight reviews. I wouldn't call all of them systematic reviews. Some of them were more narrated reviews. And uh, two of them were very topic specific. What, was, what all of these reviews concluded was there was a wide variety of methods. There are certain topics that have more prioritization than the others. They weren't able to give a conclusion. They recommended the future price setting needs to be transparent, efficient, consistent. The criteria and data used for, for price setting needs to be transparent. And the approach to price setting needs to be more democratic to involve all of the stakeholders. There was also a recommendation that the people who conduct it have to recognize and differentiate between identifying and ranking topics. and differentiate whether you have a more retrospective approach to price setting using existing data or a more futuristic approach to price setting like what people do in horizon scanning. However, the methods that these people used to do the research wasn't able to give a very clear conclusion of it. And that's what we are trying to address in our price setting Copy review, try to take an approach where we can actually provide more useful answers. Hopefully we can. OK, and um, before I go to the next um, question, those people who agree that patients would be involved in research like a part setting, would you also agree if I would say patients should be involved in biomedical research part setting? Oh, 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 that's interesting. We have even more people agreeing that patients should be involved in biomedical research. Or it might be that people just learn how to use smileys. Um, as you, as, as you might have noticed from my presentation, there are very two different, two general ap different approaches that can be used to product setting, a more technical and data-driven, and a more interpretive involving stakeholders' views. And in many cases, you could use the mixed approach. Um, from conclusion, because um, I tend not to provide a lot of, uh, when we do a lot of studies, we do come, want to like to come to some kind of helpful recommendation. And, and I'm the person who tries to find the uh, recommendation at the end. The recommendation that we have currently, which will be in a, which we would also write in a commentary in the JCE, is, is use the current evidence about informing your methods. It's not a lot, but it gives some ideas about you know, being transparent, about differentiating methods. Another useful information that you could use for prioritizing you know, research in the new field is doing systematic reviews of existing prior setting approaches, which was what Alessandro Liberati was working on. And then when you select methods, one approach that you can take is instead of independently doing the prioritization with your own team to develop partnership with groups who have experience of it. The James Day Alliance was a good example about a group who was expert in part setting working with another group, which was the Cochrane groups or the charities who wanted to need a research agenda to do a partnership and using their skills to inform their work. And they hope there would be um, that this kind of model of working would be more promoted in a collaboration if people decide to do other methods that they would partner with the prior setting group who is an expert in this. And I see also Ed has seen the send a smiley face in you know, so if you come with questions about quantitative methods I would hand over to him. So um, my next slide is about our next steps and as I said what we thought we would do as a next step is first of all we would collect all of the case studies that we find and would provide in a user friendly format for everybody in the collaboration. We would have a, a mailing list. You could re or learn from Reshma how to get joined to the mailing list and um, um, join our discussion. We would have a workshop on research price metering in Plymouth in UK, the 1st and 2nd June. If it's your favorite this vacation destination, you can also take vacation here. And, um, and um, you are applying there for primary research. So join us on our journey, and I would hand over the, the rest of the presentation to Reshma. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. So I'm going to take a cue from Mona. And if you could uh, give me a smiley face, yes. All right, thank you so much. 
So as the administrator for the Cochrane Agenda and Priority Setting Methods Group, I'm going to take you to the website for the group that has recently launched. So uh, we are now live. And uh, you will be able to access our homepage. Uh, it's right here. At the top of the slide, uh, you can access us at capsmg.cochrane.org. So uh, I'm going to take you through the first slide, which has a screenshot of the welcome page. So basically, we have um, a brief summary of the Cochrane Agenda and Priority Setting Methods Group, and uh, when we were most, uh, when did we get registered, and a little more about the objectives of the group. Also, I'd like to highlight, uh, you could uh, have a look at the pages that we have set up here on the um, menu. So taking you through these, we have a few pages on uh, more about us. So uh, Mona has already provided you with an introduction. And so these few pages are going to give a little more details uh, about us. So there is a page on Meet, meet the Team, so that has uh, introductions on each of the contributors of the team. So we have brief biographies on all the co-conveners and um, the pictures are put up there. And you, we also have a list of our collaborators. We have a page on background and history. So uh, we have a little more details on uh, the background behind why the Cochrane Methods Group was set up and a uh, history of the meetings that took place along with the minutes. So you can understand uh, what kind of discussions took place that led to the conception of the agenda and priority setting methods group. And of course, a page on the scope of our work. We also have a few pages on trainings and workshops. I'll be taking uh, talking about that a little more in detail on the next slide. Publications and presentations how you can get more involved uh, with our group, and of course, the Contact Us page. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. I have uh, the Scope for Work page. So this is going to uh, give you details on the objectives for the group, the functions that the group is going to carry out within the Cochrane collaboration, and a bit more on the working plan of the group for the next three years. So you can watch out for, uh, you can have a brief of the ideas and the activities that are planned uh, within this methods group. And the box right here just tells you where you can find this page on the menu. So on to the next slide. We have uh, the trainings and workshop page. And uh, so we here we have a list of the trainings and workshops that we are planning within the methods group that's going to give you, uh, introduce you to our priority setting methodology. So here we have uh, the current webinar series that's ongoing. And also we have a planned a two-day international workshop in June that's going to take place in the UK. Um, right now it's in the planning stages, but once we have uh, more information and uh, finalized agenda, so that will be placed on the website for you to look at. Moving on to the next slide. We have a page on publications and presentations. So this page basically gives you a list of publications that have been authored by the members of our group. We have a list of presentations that have been conducted by uh, the Cook and Reno. Uh, read more about uh, the work that the Priority Setting Methods Group has been involved in by reading the publications and presentations on this page. And of course, we will be adding a few more um, publication relevant to priority setting. So this list is a growing list. And if you would like to contribute papers that you find relevant uh, and you would like uh, for it to be displayed on the website, you could send that to me at my contact email address. So moving on to this slide, 
I would like to highlight that we are conducting an online survey, as Mona mentioned earlier. So uh, we are conducting a survey on the challenges in priority setting, and this is mainly for those who have been involved in the research priority setting in the, in the past and uh, within the Cochrane entity. So if you have been involved in such an exercise, we would like you to fill out this form and give us the three most important challenges that you have encountered within priority setting. So this information is going to help us uh, incorporate it within our activities for the methods group and will help us help Cochrane entities in a better way. So please do visit this page and fill out the form and we look forward to your participation. And here you could find it under the Get Involved tab on the menu. Lastly, I'd like to go back to the welcome page. So I'd like to highlight that we have a button that links you directly to the survey that's being placed on the welcome page, so you're definitely not going to miss it. Um, I'd like to point out that you could subscribe to our newsroom um, for any latest updates on our activities and events. Last but not the least, we have the contact us page where you could find contact email addresses of uh, the contributors, co-conveners, and of course uh, the administrator, myself. And if you'd like to have uh, if you'd like to interact with any of us, oh, and if thank you have you any much, questions, Rishma, you just um, um, next to that, uh, is email Sally, us, and we will get back to you. So thank you, and uh, over to you, Mona. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm speaking from Oxford. In the UK, where it's very, very sunny and very, very cold. For those of you that can see out of where you're sitting, if you have a window, can you give me a smiley face if it's also sunny where you are? I can also tell if you can hear me. That's great. OK. So I'm going to spend my um, 10 minutes of this webinar just giving you a flavor of what the James Lind Alliance does. And I will focus a little bit on our priority setting methods. Um, during the presentation, I will keep referring to what we call priority setting partnerships. These are partnerships that are the backbone and the model that we use in the James Lind Alliance. Um, this is the diagram on the right hand side in blue is the sort of ideal partnership that we like to put together for each disease area that we work in. So there will be the relevant professional groups, there will be relevant patient and carer groups, there will be relevant medical research charities. We would recruit and work with the uh, relevant Cochrane review groups. And if there's a, a clinical research network, we'd also like to work with them. We don't always get that perfect partnership, but that's what we try for. We would have some sort of awareness meeting or, or teleconference where we would get to know each other a little bit. We would find out about our um, relative um, organizations. And we talk about our aspirations for priority setting, but also perhaps some of our anxieties. I'm going to take you on to an overview of what the James Lind Alliance does. So we've been running since about 2006, and we have currently completed or uh, have ongoing um, 16 priority setting partnerships. And this is what each of them will go through as a process. The first step will be to gather treatment uncertainties, and we do that from people using surveys, focus groups, interviews, and we also do it from research. So we look for what's in research recommendations from various databases. It's not uncommon in a survey to get over a thousand treatment uncertainties back from participants, both professional and patient and carer. So clearly there's a job then to refine them and check that they are indeed uncertain and there isn't a systematic review that already addresses that question. We then publish them on UK Duets, which is part of NHS Evidence in the UK, which is part of NICE. And that is a database that holds all of the treatment uncertainties um, in the work that we do. We then move into prioritization. And we do this um, in several ways. Uh, at several levels, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Once we finish prioritization, 
We would then publish the results, both in peer review journals, but also through patient and carer networks and newsletters and blogs and so on and so forth. And we're currently finding Twitter very helpful for that aspect of the work. And then the final step, which is perhaps the most important, is apply for funding for those priority research areas. And that is the golden egg, if you like, of each partnership. That's what they're aiming for, to identify um, 10 research priorities that they will then seek funding for from a variety of sources. We reckon we can do this in under a year, given um, we have the right resources and skills and capacity in the partnership. So really what we've done is create and establish an infrastructure and a process for gathering, publishing, and prioritizing therapeutic research questions in partnerships of patients and clinicians. The next slide just shows you where we are with our work. The left-hand column in red is all the completed partnerships. The right-hand column in black are the ones that are currently ongoing. And they're all at various stages of development. And you can track their progress on the James Lind Alliance website and see if there are any sort of surveys open uh, currently. I think there are three of them. What we're finding with these partnerships is that when they come up with their top 10 research priorities, there are themes across them. And we've just been discussing in our team whether we're going to introduce a new concept called a super uncertainty, which means something that's shared across disease areas and chronic condition areas. Um, and a good example for that would be long-term effects of steroids. Um, and that has cropped up in the top, very top of the top 10 for asthma, vitiligo, and eczema. And I think there's some learning here for both the James and Alliance, but hopefully also the Cochrane Methods Group about when we start seeing patterns of priorities across um, different groups that are active in this area. OK, my last but one slide is going to just focus on the methods that we use. Um, you can get much more information about what we do on our guidebook site, which I've just realized I haven't put a link for on my slides, which is unforgivable. So I'll make sure we do that on the um, Cochrane uh, Agenda and Prior Setting Methods Group website, Rashmel. I'll make sure I send you that. So here are our, our methods. Um, the first thing to say is that I mentioned earlier that we might get more than a 1,000 treatment uncertainties from, for example, from a survey. And clearly, they fall into two groups. Um, there are the ones that are, are similar, and then there are ones that are unique. And roughly, in a, in a, in a group, a data pool of about 1,000 uncertainties, about a third would be um, very similar, and two thirds would be unique. Now, when they're similar, we start to put them together, a bit like you do in systematic reviewing. Are they similar enough to combine? And we call those indicative uncertainties. The unique ones, in other words, one person has made one question which is sufficiently different from everything else, stays a unique question. They get deprioritized at the beginning of the process. So that's our first step of prioritization. So from step one onwards, we're working with uncertainties that are coming from several people and often across professional and patient and carer groups. The next step would be for the steering group to look at what's, what we're left with from that process and create a long list uh, for voting. And we generally don't go over 50 items for voting. We've experienced problems when we've gone over 50. And so a second step of priority setting will be the steering group that makes some of those decisions. So clearly, the composition of the steering group is really important and needs to reflect all the partner organizations that are in the partnership. The third step is we send out um, either online or paper this long list, and people vote on it. And different partnerships have different rules about this, but we give people a minimum of three votes. Some partnerships like more votes to be shared out. Step four, the, sh the steering group will review those voting results and create a short list, perhaps 25 to 30 items, uh, treatment uncertainties. And this is what will be taken forward for final priority setting. And this happens in a, what we call um, our final workshop. Um, we use something called nominal group technique, which is a combination of discussion in small and larger groups, plus voting or ranking of the items in the shortlist. Um, principally, people come to a workshop, 
having looked at the shortlist themselves and think about what it means for them and make notes on it and individually rank them from their own perspective. And that gives them something to talk about in that very first um, discussion group. So we go through a series of group discussions and ranking of the items. And then we combine those across the small groups and work with what we call an aggregate rank in a larger group. And if you look at the picture on the left-hand side, you'll see that's the workshop in action where we are looking at um, uh, the items to be discussed. And we, we do that. They, they are written up on, on cards. And we use that in our workshops. It's very accessible. And it helps us keep focus in the discussions. We finally just wanted to say that we're just piloting a workshop where we're going to the next step, which is taking those top 10 uncertainties and turning them into really good research questions and bringing together groups of patients and carers and professionals and researchers and working with those uncertainties to turn them into really good questions. And we've just done that in eczema to, to very, very good effect. So I'm going to finish my my presentation with a question for you. Currently, in the James Lind Alliance, we gather genuine treatment uncertainties and we vote and discuss on what is important to patient carers and parents and health professionals. What we don't discuss is the burden of disease, the cost to the health system, that more sort of dense, dense data, as I call it. Now, can you imagine? yourselves in a workshop room. So before I ask Erin to tell you how to vote, I want you to imagine you're in a room with 40 other people and you've been discussing up to 30 research uncertainties in great detail, taking in turn to share your experiences and understandings. Do you think that we should also have information available on that day about populations in that disease, about economic data of treatments? And that's what I want you to vote on now. I'm going to hand over to Erin, who's going to tell you how to do this. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So a couple of you have already seen how to click ABC. You'll find this underneath the participant window. A for voting yes, B for voting no, and vote C if you're not sure what the answer is. So if you can take a moment, underneath where all of the names are listed, you'll see A, B, C. Please indicate your vote. Back over. Thank you very much, Erin. So the votes are coming in. And there's quite a spread between opinion, and that's what I would ex expect. We have discussed this in our group a great deal. There's a slight ahead of the group A's who say we should. And, and that's very, very interesting. And thank you for giving your opinion on that. Um, I will finish my um, presentation with just saying this is something that I think we will be discussing, obviously, in the Cochrane Agenda and Price Priority Setting Methods Group, because we recognize that the James Lind Alliance is just one approach and one way of looking at priority setting. So thank you very much for taking the time to, to consider that question. I'm now going to hand back to Erin, I think, for a, a, a question and discussion session. Is that right, Erin? Thank you, Sally. So at this point, um, there is an opportunity for anybody to ask any questions that they may have of any of the presenters we've heard thus far. So if you did have a question, um, please feel free to send it through to the chat room. And we'll read those questions out loud so that the presenters can answer them. So I'll just give everybody a moment to, uh, to think if they had any questions about priority setting, about the James Lind Alliance, perhaps about Mona's survey, or about how you can be involved in the methods group. Well, I let everybody think about that. I actually did have one question myself. And one thing I was wondering was, uh, I noticed that I was, I think, the only person who disagreed with having funders as part of the priority setting. And I guess my, my thinking behind that had been that, um, had been that uh, having a funder in the room for the priority setting might bias or prejudice the results, although I do think one should take into account uh, the priorities of funders when conducting your priority setting. So I wonder if any of the presenters uh, 
could share with me why everybody else might have said yes. I'm, I'm curious why people feel that funders should be in the room. Could one of the presenters answer that? Thank you, Erin. I'll answer that. Uh, the reason I'll answer it is because we do have funders in the room. Um, funders sometimes come and observe priority setting workshops to see how the process works and to see the sort of discussions that take place. I have to confess that um, the priority setting partnerships think this is a great idea because clearly the funders are perhaps more engaged with the items under discussion. But I couldn't honestly tell you how, um, what effect that has subsequent to the, uh, to the process completing. So that would be my perspective. Thank you very much for that. I wonder if anybody else in the room had any other questions that they wanted to ask uh, of the presenters thus far. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody typing in, so at this point, perhaps we'll turn it over to Vivian Welch to continue the presentation. And again, if you do have any questions, please feel free to write them into the, uh, into the chat room, and the presenter will take them at, at the correct time. Thank you so much. Over to Vivian. Hello. Um, I guess I'll just do a test like everybody else. Um, can everybody hear me? Um, if you can maybe put a happy face. Uh, OK, it looks like people can hear me. Um, so uh, thank you, Erin, for uh, giving the Priority Studying Group a chance to, to run these webinars. Um, and thank you to all the participants. Um, I'm uh, just going to give a few minutes about a project that we're doing, which is more of an applied approach to priority setting. Um, some of you may know about uh, Cochrane Evidence Aid. Could people maybe indicate with a happy face if they've heard about Cochrane Evidence Aid or seen it on the website? OK, so a few people. Um, Evidence Aid, the Cochrane Evidence Aid was uh, developed after the tsunami in uh, 2004. And the idea was to make uh, evidence from um, uh, systematic reviews available to people um, dealing with uh, healthcare emergencies or natural disasters. And to do it in a way that would be uh, sort of easy to find um, and uh, grouped according to um, the uh, questions that decision makers might be asking. Um, so, um, and then to also have a user friendly summary. Um, and our group, um, I'm uh, part of the Cochrane and Campbell Equity Methods group. Um, so, our group is interested in health equity and um, what we know from systematic reviews about how to improve health equity or how to improve the health of disadvantaged um, people. Um, and so, we talked with uh, Mike Clark, uh, who is um, at the moment leading the evidence aid. Um, at the time when it was developed, um, um, Prathap, who I believe is on the call, is on the webinar. Maybe he didn't make it today. Um, Prathap Sarian, Sally Green, um, and uh, Steve McDonald uh, were all um, part of the initial response to evidence aid. Um, at any rate, we talked with Mike Clark about whether we might do something about equity evidence aid. So what works for the disadvantaged, and how could we um, do that? Um, let me see if I can advance the slide. And what we wanted to do with Equity Evidence Aid was to set priorities based on impacts. We wanted to look at things that um, are effective. Um, and that's um, maybe an a interesting criteria to take. But um, in our um, work in setting up the group on equity, we found a lot of criticism about um, systematic reviews as a source of evidence because they often conclude we don't know. Um, so we want to start with um, uh, winners where we do know there is an effect. And we wanted to set priorities based on um, uh, decision maker questions. So um, for example, um, we've um, been working with uh, Zulfi Buta, who is um, uh, well known in the nutrition area about what are the high priority questions for improving um, uh, 
nutrition, especially childhood and uh, maternal nutrition. Um, and um, I guess secondly, we wanted to focus on rigorous systematic reviews, but not necessarily Cochrane. Um, we want to have a user-friendly format that we are following um, what the Canadian Health Services uh, Research Foundation calls uh, 11325, so one line, one page, three page, and then all the detail in a, in a longer document. And um, we wanted to assess especially the um, uh, questions that we've been asked when we speak with decision makers is, does this apply in my setting? Um, what are the effects on health equity? And how do we monitor um, the effects of this intervention and improve the implementation? Um, we also wanted to include a searchable, a, a way that it could be searched that made sense to decision makers. And um, we want to include more than just health interventions, so social, economic, and legal interventions. So at the moment, we're working on this. And uh, in terms of priority setting, um, we've been going to the um, leaders, such as Zulfi Buta and um, the WHO Nutrition Group, um, for content-specific expertise. Um, and we're discussing with Mike Clark whether we might do uh, more broad surveying for priorities um, from a broader community of decision makers. So I think that's all I had to say about equity evidence aid. And I think I'll, I'll turn it over, because I know we are uh, trying to uh, cover a lot of topics in our one hour. So we're going to turn it over to Sandy Oliver, who's going to be presenting on prioritization of outcomes. Over to Sandy. OK, I think I'm here. Can anybody hear me now? Yes, good. OK, thank you very much. Um, with the prioritization group, we're definitely learning as we go. And I really only just got my head around the idea of priority setting questions and, or uncertainties uh, with the James Lind Alliance when I came across the idea that you can also prioritize outcomes. Uh, so just recapping on what Sally was saying about prioritizing questions, these are gaps, neglected areas uh, in the existing evidence that are important to both the service users and the clinicians, um, but aren't addressed by up-to-date systematic reviews. And at the moment, um, we're looking at this in the area of delayed cord clamping for very preterm birth. But for review groups, there's another challenge to think about, not just individual questions, but the outcomes that might be used across a whole range of questions that are closely related. The idea that we might need agreed, standardized sets of outcomes that are measured and reported in all clinical trials in a small area, although how small uh, is a debatable point. These outcomes would have to be important to the patients and clinicians because the reviews are there to help clinical decision making. They have to be credibly linked to the interventions being assessed. But they also have to be measurable and sensitive to change. So they are practical, not just aspirational. The purpose of um, priority setting the research gaps is to come up with clear research questions that matter to both patients and clinicians. But the intention of prioritizing the outcomes is to be able to present research findings in standardized ways across different but closely related reviews in terms that matter to both patients and clinicians. 
even getting my head around what an outcome is uh, was quite tricky. And I think we're, we're still, this is still a big debate about how to tackle this area. I thought I knew what an outcome was until I met people who were thinking about it a bit more deeply. Outcomes can be considered in different levels of detail. So in this diagram, uh, you might have outcomes in, that are actually quite a large domain, you know, like anxiety being a whole domain um, that is different from depression or schizophrenia. But to measure anxiety, one needs a measure, uh, an instrument, and there, there are different instruments for measuring anxiety. And these instruments may be uh, similar or not, and it may be justified to combine results or not, or to compare results across reviews or not. And then those measures may, may be made in different ways. You may choose to measure a change from the baseline, or the time until something happens, or a, a value at a particular point. And then there are ways of combining those outcomes in the reviews, as I, because they're either continuous measures or categorical measures. They have to be dealt with differently. So this means that outcomes and the way they're measured are really complicated. And if we want to think about presenting a core set of outcomes across similar reviews, we have to be very clear about what's important and what's possible. And the argument isn't that we only present the information on these outcomes, but that that would be a minimum set. So of course, there's some priority setting to be done, thinking through what would fall within the minimum set for any particular area of health questions. We know from what Sally said that prioritizing research gaps, one way of doing it is asking clinicians and service users to rack their brains, work out what's important that they don't know, and gather that information, develop methods to uh, get people to think carefully, and then come together and debate it and come to decisions. The model that the James Lind Alliance uses, the researchers there are as a resource. They provide information about whether the uh, research gaps, the questions that people are asking, really haven't been addressed by research or not. And then we also need facilitators to help everybody work together creatively. But trying to work out what, which outcomes to include in a core set might be a bit different. Maybe the clinicians, service users, and the researchers, their roles might be a bit different in trying to choose those core outcomes. Maybe they diff need different sort of knowledge. And it might need a, a different way of reaching consensus. There are lots of people trying this out at the moment, and they're coming together to discuss their different ways of trying it out as part of the COMET initiative, which is COMET stands for Core Outcome Measures of Effectiveness in Trials. And I don't think anybody's decided that there's a right way to do it. Everybody's just trying to be try out different ways and be clear about reporting what their, uh, what, what their experience is. So the challenges for setting priorities for review questions and the challenges for setting priorities for core outcome sets are, are different. For finding the research gaps, the, the problem might be 
that we find questions that are important to patients and clinicians, but those questions might not be answerable. Alternatively, we might find measurable outcomes to fit in a core set, but that they're not important to patients and clinicians. So this leaves us with a huge uh, methodological agenda trying to work out how best can these different groups of people work together, what uh, specialist knowledge do they bring, how do their contributions differ, what methods help them contribute, and uh, how do the methods for identifying the research gaps or the review questions complement the me methods for identifying the core outcome sets. Uh, we're going to have a go at trying to find our way through some of this model uh, with a James Lind Alliance partnership for preterm birth. So I'm afraid I'm not telling you anything useful. I'm just saying that the challenge might be bigger than we thought when we started. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of the presenters today. Thank you to Mona, to Reshma, to Sally, Vivian, and to Sandy. At this point, we'd like to open the floor to anybody on the call today who has any questions for any of the presenters on the material that was presented or a follow-up question to, something, to a topic that may have, uh, may have tweaked your interest. And I see that, uh, that Sally has written in asking, Sandy, keywords that I am taking away from your presentation are outcomes. Important? Possible? So Sandy, I wonder if you might be able to respond to that. Um, yes, I think that with Cochrane reviews, because they are supposed to support decision making, we definitely want important outcomes in there. But sometimes, at the moment, impo important outcomes, we don't know how to measure them. And so some of the work might be um, working out how to measure them and then going back and doing reviews again, or, or primary research and reviews again. So it, it makes the agenda larger. Thank you, Sandy. Are there any other questions from people on the call today? I see a couple of people writing in, so we'll just give a moment. While we're waiting for some of those questions to come through, one thing that I'd like to do is send around an evaluation form. Um, this evaluation form is really important for the work that we do here at the Center. It helps us meet your needs, your, your comments will be quoted in our annual reports, and evaluations let us know how we're doing, which speakers to invite back, what tools to use again, which formats to change, and so forth. And so I'm about to send an evaluation form through, and if you could please take a few moments um, right now to complete that form and return it. It would be most appreciated, thank you. It really does help our speakers. So you should see a screen coming up on, uh, in front of the whiteboard there um, that will show a progress of that file coming through. If you could please take a moment to complete that, it would be really appreciated, thank you. And in the meantime, are there any other questions from people on the floor? I see that uh, I see that Yannick has written in, Sandy, it seems for me even more challenging to bring together different stakeholders in this case. Very interesting, though. So Sandy, I, w I wonder if you could maybe speak about uh, the challenges of involving different stakeholders. We'll just give Sandy a moment to think about that. And Sally has written in another question saying, in our workshops, we talk about outcomes in the context of therapeutic research all the time. And I wonder if we can harness or capture this better. 
So I wonder if any of the participants today might have any comments on, on how we could do that better, or some of the challenges in involving different stakeholders. I'll give a moment for people to perhaps write in their responses. Pam's written in regarding Sandy's comments. I think there could be particular challenges to engage patients in methodological debates, and especially considerations for facilitators. Absolutely, the challenges in engaging patients when it comes to methodology. Thank you so much for that comment, Pam. Any other comments? Tracy's written in, thank you for the informative session. There's also the issue of core outcomes for research and those collected in everyday clinical practice and how we may develop coordinated core outcome sets. Thank you for raising those issues. Sandy, I wonder if you might be able to speak to that. I can't offer any solutions at the moment. I think I think probably the, the people who are more important than, they, than they're usually given credit for are the facilitators because we're bringing together clinicians, patients, researchers, and actually each of those groups are very heterogeneous as well. They all have their specialist areas and they all use their different languages. So I think the facilitators uh, have a hard job helping to bring those people to uh, discuss things out of their comfort zones. Um, we're, we're making progress with thinking about research questions, although research questions can be sometimes uh, slightly abstract, whereas a measure is not abstract at all. And uh, I think that will that'll bring extra problems. Thank you for those comments. I see that Mona has written in that she remembers Sally mentioned once that even in current priority setting approaches, people ask questions that have an outcome component. So assume there's a basic interest there to be involved in this decision. Sally, I wonder if maybe you could comment on that. Um, thanks, Mona, for the question. Yeah, when, we, when we're refining the survey responses, um, some come in as very well constructed research questions as you, as you would expect, from, especially from professionals, but often from patients too and carers. But some come in as narratives or a collection of random thoughts or an experience they want to put down um, in writing. And sometimes we have to interpret that. And how we do that is by using the PICO structure, population, intervention, outcome, and comparator. And so that does help us identify outcomes. Some, some submissions don't mention outcomes. Um, and so we can do two levels of outcome work. I've just been reflecting on it as, as Sandy was uh, presenting her ideas. I think we can do something about looking at the outcome components in uncertainties um, in UK duets. I, I don't know how we do that. Maybe there's some sort of data mining software we could use. Um, but, but also, I think there's a, a more rich potential source of discussions within our workshops where we inevitably talk about outcomes when we're talking about uh, research, therapeutic research um, uncertainties and questions. And I, I'm not sure we've given that enough attention um, in the past. And I will, one of the things I'm going to go away as a result of this webinar is to have a think about that and also how we can bring that back into the um, methods group. Um, so thanks for jogging my memory, Mona, you're right. <laughs> um, and I'll, um, I'll come back to everyone on that. I'm just trying to turn off the microphone. Thank you so much for that response, Sally. I'll wait just a moment to see if there are any other responses or questions from, uh, from the participants on today's session. Um, I do see Mona's just typing in, so we'll give her a second. But in the meantime, I'd like to ask everybody to send a round of applause 
to thank our participants and to thank our presenters for today. I really appreciate the time that the presenters have taken to share this with us and to the participants for joining today's session. So a round of applause to our presenters. So thank you very much for joining us today. If there are no other, qu oh, I see a question has just come in. Um, Yannicka has asked, Sally, did you already consider updating priorities? So considerations around updating. Sally, I wonder if you could answer that. Hello, Yanka. Lovely to, lovely to see you and hear from you. Um, yes, uh, we returned to the very first um, priority setting partnership in asthma. And in fact, I think Mona mentioned this earlier. This was a lovely piece of work where we um, worked with the Cochrane Airways Group to review the um, uncertainties that were gathered from that exercise, not just the priorities, but actually all the uncertainties. And they mapped them onto their systematic review uh, portfolio, which was a tremendously helpful exercise. And then um, we brought in the big sort of asthma um, charity patient group in the UK to also work um, on that project. And then coincidentally, the Cochrane Airways group uh, were asked to help um, set priorities for asthma UK charity. So there was a lovely sort of circle going on. But um, I think we've probably underestimated the amount of work that would take to update priorities, but I think your question is very well made and I think it's something we have to encourage partnerships to think about when they complete their first priority setting is what aspirations do they have to return to those. I think the top ten are always in people's minds and we always roughly know what's happening with those in terms of research responses. I I don't think we do that with the rest of the data, if I'm actually really honest with you. So it's a really good question. Thank you. I see that Mona's just given a, uh, Mona's given a reminder of the upcoming pr uh, priority setting webinars for the rest of the Fridays in February. The Cochrane Airway Group that Sally mentioned also presents in one of the Friday, um, Fridays in February webinars. That's going to be the webinar that's on February 17th. Equity is next week. Um, that'll be talking about an equity lens for priority setting. And the last presentation on February 24th is a presentation of a few Cochrane Review Groups, some tips and tricks for review groups doing prioritization. So we hope that you can join us for those as well. And again, thank you so much for joining today. The moderators for today's session, I think, will be on for another couple moments if there are any questions to come through. And otherwise, we thank you very much for joining us today. And please do fill out those evaluation forms. Thank you so much, everybody. One comment that's just come up from one of the uh, one of the moderators that I'd like to share with everybody is that this session has indeed been recorded, and in about a week's time, you'll be able to find it on YouTube. There will be links off the Canadian Cochrane Center's webpage. So if you'd like to hear parts of the session again, or if you would like to uh, if you would like to share this information with somebody else who wasn't able to attend today, you'll find a link off the Canadian Cochrane Center's webpage. And if you look at the whiteboard, you'll see I'm just going to type in that web page now. It's ccc.cochrane.org. So I've just added the website there to that page if you'd like to find the YouTube video. Thank you.